Hey there and welcome to SI Now. It's Wednesday, January 4th. I'm Ryan Aselta. It's great to be with you this afternoon. Coming up, we get you ready for Wild Card Weekend in the NFL with Redskins legend Joe Theismann. And we take a look at the hot trade rumors in the NBA with Brent Barry. But we begin in college football where our Maggie Gray recently sat down with legendary Florida State coach Bobby Bowden. Bowden won 377 games over his 44-year career, which ranks third all-time in Division 1A. But these days, the now 87-year-old coach is impressed by a coaching legend still in the making, Alabama's Nick Saban. Here's part one of Maggie's interview with the Hall of Fame coach. Why is Nick Saban the best? How has he separated himself from all these other great coaches as the, the guy right now? He has certainly done that. You hit it right on the head. Why? How? Number one, he's very intense about football. He can hire anybody and win because it's him. And, uh, and I, I think it's the fact that he is a tireless worker and that he's very intelligent about football, about the fundamentals of football. And, and, and the, one of the greatest things he does is keeps his head, keeps his players' heads level. Keeping your boys hungry and wanting to go out and play hard as they can, that's hard to do when you're winning. How did you do it? I, I just, I kept preaching to them about we might get beat, we might get beat. You know, just trying to sell them to stay on top of it. And, uh, but, but Nick has, he's, he's a master at that. You, you can tell him, you can watch him talk after, after they won last week. Oh, we got to be careful next week. We got to be careful next week or we'll get beat. You know, he keeps those kids uh, uh, on the defense, you know. You mentioned about Nick Saban, how he can hire anybody and really he can win with any personnel. There's a new story now that his offensive coordinator, Lane Kiffin, he's basically shown him the door a week before the bowl game. We may never know what really happened between yeah. the two of them. But what does that signal to you, someone who is so masterful in so that, many bowls? That's one reason I make that statement. Now, he took, here, here's K K Kiffin, failed at, uh, in pro ball, failed at Tennessee, failed at Southern Cal, and the best coach in the country hires him, offensive coordinator. Number one, you're taking a chance when you keep a coach that's got another job Lined because up. he's going to spend half his time trying to hire staff. You better. You better get a staff down there. You know what? I think – Coach uh, Saban just felt like time had run out. I can't let him stay another week. That's the only way I can see it. Yeah. Is it a risky move? Uh, and, and, uh, it could be. Can the next guy do the job? Now, I think he can. Now, let me, uh, you know, all of the success they had at Southern Cal, they tell me a lot of that was Sarkeesian. You know what? So I, 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 I have to feel like Saban knows what he's doing. He's won championship, Saban is away from Bear Bryant. Do you think he'll ever leave Alabama, Nick Saban? I, I would think that, that sooner or later, and it could be later, that he'd lose his incentive. You know, I, in fact, I remember last year when I ran into Saban, I went to Tuscaloosa to play in his golf tournament. And he was sitting there talking to a couple of guys. So I walked up. When I walked up, he's, he, one of the first things he said, he said, you know, I'm really tired. I said, I really got tired this season. So now, and when he, when he said that, I thought, well, you know, you don't want to get too tired. You won't want to coach anymore. But, you know, sooner, sooner or later, hit you. Now, I got 80. I went to I was 80. I don't know if he can go to 80 or not. But he's liable. To, if he's winning like it, he can do it. We're heading into the national championship game. Yeah. We know last year, Saban had to use the onside kick. Yeah. That's a little trickeration. Sure did. You were famous for this. No. The Bowden Ruskies. No. Oh, yeah. All the trick plays. Tell us, Coach, what is the key to pulling off a successful trick play? One thing is to, as you look at another team, and if you find a certain glaring, um, I start to say weakness, the way, the way Clemson lined up, they left the right hash over there open. He spotted that. Many, many coaches, most of them would not have done, done a thing about it. He, he worked on it, worked on his kicker, put it right over there where he wanted it. Now, I don't think if he, if he hadn't have done it, I think he'd have got beat. He couldn't stop that yeah. guy. I think he would have got beat, but he dared to do it. You do it at the wrong time, it don't work. You know what? you got to find the perfect. Just like when we ran the punt, punt ruski, 
We were, we were behind 14 to 7. I, I wanted to go in behind because I can jump on my boys. Now, they're not going to jump on there because they're ahead. And so I told them, no, don't run it because let's wait. And so we waited and so until the last possible moment and ran it at the right time. Any other time, it wouldn't have worked. As I mentioned, you accomplished everything really from the outset that you set to accomplish, the national championship, the undefeated season, all the things that you accomplished. What was the biggest obstacle, though, for you? Biggest, biggest obstacle? What is the biggest obstacle that you face? I think is if you let up in your recruiting, if, or if your coaches let up, you know, it could, you maybe don't get the good kids anymore. Uh, do a poor job of evaluating. See, that, uh, that's another strength of, uh, him, of Saban. He evaluates so good. In other words, he, he goes and gets a tackle, signs a tackle to come to Alabama, and the kid becomes a great tackle. Let's say some other coach recruits a tackle, and he really not as good as he thought he was. He gets fired. You know what? But I think he does a great job of evaluating talent. Who's going to win this national championship? Now that that's a I'm about to, now if you'd ask me week before last, I said well, Alabama, and nobody in the country can beat them, and I nearly still think that now the only thing that's thrown doubt doubt in my mind, Clemson beat Ohio State like a drum. I have never seen Ohio State get pushed around in my life. We played them three times at, at Florida State. I've never seen anybody put. They are always the dominant physical team. Look at the last time they played Alabama. They beat them for the national championship. When Clemson beat them 30 to nothing, I mean, they couldn't even cross the 50-yard line. I'm saying, now hold it. I think they have the talent to beat Alabama. I'm still not sure if they're tight enough. In other words, Saban's going to play early and small. If Alabama's quarterback plays like he did last week, and the quarter, Clemson plays the best they can play. If I knew that was going to happen, I'd take Clemson, but I'm not sure. Coach Bowden, it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. I should mention the movie, The Bowden Dynasty, debuts live in theaters nationwide from the NCAA Football National Championship in Tampa. The movie debuts January 8th. You can catch the game, of course, on January 9th. Man, 87 years old, coach looks fantastic, and is clearly still on top of the college game. In case you were wondering, Nick Saban is still 167 wins behind the legendary Florida State coach. Maggie's going to talk more with Coach Bowden on tomorrow's show. Now to basketball, where the turn of the new year is starting to give us a little bit of clarity in the NBA. Big game coming up tomorrow night on TNT when the Rockets and Thunder go at it. Brent Barry will be on the call and he joins us now. And Brent, Houston and Oklahoma City have split their two games so far this season. Both games decided by a combined five points. How evenly matched are the Rockets and Thunder at this point? Yeah, hey Ryan, uh, happy new year to you. Uh, I guess Christmas keeps on giving. How about this game we're going to have on Thursday? I'm, I'm super stoked about it. And uh, you're right, those games have been incredibly close interestingly enough james harden has not played uh he's had big numbers but not played particularly well shooting the basketball in those games uh yet it's been split so it'll be interesting at home especially what these two guys have been doing as of late it's uh, going to be super exciting I, i'm even shaving today before the game that means it's a that means it's a big game <laughs> yeah, you know it's a huge game when you got the razor out a day beforehand. Well, yeah, done, I don't Brent. do that. I don't do that. Maybe Marv will shave too. We'll see. <laughs> a clean shaven bunch on Thursday <laughs> night. All right. OKC loses Monday night to the Bucks. The Thunder are now eight and eleven when Russell Westbrook doesn't record a triple double. What do you think? Are the Thunder too reliant on one player to be considered a contender in the West? Well, I mean that's what they are, and uh, I think it's been remarkable to this point that. Uh, um, the Donovan has his guys at sitting here this far into the season. There's a lot of people felt like there was just not enough help for Russell and what he does, but they've sort of just morphed themselves into the Russell Westbrook show. And it's been interesting over the course of what December represented. They were missing Oladipo, who's supposed to be, you know, his running mate in the backcourt. He suffered that wrist injury and they actually had their best offensive month without him 
in the lineup. So with January, all these road games they have, they have 12 of 15 games on the road. Oladipo is just getting back into the lineup. It'll be very interesting to see how it is that Billy Donovan starts to get him back into the flow of the offense and if he starts to split the minutes again because they got some great production from their bench. Even though five and four during those nine games that uh, that he missed, uh, they definitely need him to consistently. And we'll see if January, if they can survive what their schedule has in front of them. Now, uh, speaking of contenders, your colleague at TNT, Charles Barkley, had some interesting things to say about the NBA last week. Saying no that, way. No yeah, way. I know. He surprise, surprise. Charles, oh uh, a little God. bit of controversy surrounding wow. him here. Yeah. He talked about parity and said the league is the worst it's ever been top to bottom. The criticism yeah. comes while we're seeing a deep pool of individual stars putting up big time numbers this season. D do you agree with Chuck? And is the NBA as bad as he says it is? You know, I just, uh, I hope I'm not people that with age comes uh, cynicism. I don't, uh, I think Charles is way off base. I, I think that what we're seeing right now in the NBA, at least, at least in terms of his offensive, the offensiveness and the, and the incredible explosion of the young talent that we have, that the game really collectively hasn't been better. I mean, it's, it's so fun to watch the ball move around, people move around, to see some of the numbers and some of the things that guys are doing on an individual basis. There's somebody on most every team that you want to watch on a nightly basis, and that includes Philly. So uh, the league is fun, fun far, and, and at this point, um, I disagree with Charles entirely. Uh, is uh, the East better than the West, and is there better star power than there was in you know an era long ago? I, I don't know. That's debatable for a lot of people. But I think the game has never been in a better place, and we've got some young studs, and I really enjoy watching it. Amazing. We're having MVP conversations about Russell Westbrook and James Harden, not even talking about LeBron James, Steph Curry, and Kevin Durant. So it shows that uh, – the depth of talent, as we talked about, is pretty deep right now. How about the trade deadline, Brent? Uh, still over a month away, but a strong report out right now suggesting the Hawks are looking to move Paul Millsap. Uh, do you think that's the right move for Atlanta, and, and where do you see him fitting in? Well, I mean, Paul Millsap is the kind of guy, I think, with his skill set, he's going to fit in just about anywhere. And uh, the interesting thing is what team really at this point with Paul Millsap, given his age and given the contract situation where he's looking to – extend after the season's over with um is somebody going to take him out on loan for that season and then and then keep him into next year I, I don't know for the atlanta hawks to be competitive paul Millsap is their guy i mean if they lose paul Millsap or or the situation becomes uh, such that paul is communicating to the team that he'd like to continue his career somewhere else then of course atlanta has to look at all options and, and get something for him but to this point, that hasn't been what Paul has been talking about. His direct quotes have been that he wants to be in Atlanta. He wants to stay there. And for Atlanta to stay competitive, uh, he's the best player that they have right now and gives them the best chance to be competitive in the playoffs. So it be interesting to see what, what, what it does to Atlanta and whether or not, whether or not they want to make that move and, and bottom themselves out and give themselves some flexibility. You mentioned age and contract situation, so let's talk about the New York Knicks, right? They've lost five straight, a ton of controversy surrounding Carmelo Anthony. He's been criticized for his lack of defense. Coach Jeff Hornacek seems to be getting frustrated with him now on, on both ends of the floor. Has the time come for the Knicks to try and, and work something out with Melo and eventually part ways here? Well, it's just going to be fascinating. This is not something that has not happened before uh, with Melo in terms of trying to get him to engage on the defensive end of the floor. But there's also a lot of uh, fluidity in what it is that the Knicks represent this year. Jeff Hornacek, first-year coach. Derek Rose trying to regain some footing there in New York. First time, uh, obviously, there, first season for him. Noah struggles, although as of late he's played better. And then the development of, of Chris Stapps and where you want to go with Porzingis. So the, the interesting part about all that um, is that it's New York, so it draws a lot more attention than anywhere else. And Melo has the, the option, I guess, at this point where he can decide whether or not he wants to go and continue somewhere else. And that's an interesting facet of all that. Does Melo want to go somewhere else? Deep down, he's always – for him so how do you move the immovable object if it's not something he's willing to do 
Yeah, Knicks hands may ultimately be tied when it comes to mid-February. Well, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Eastern on TNT, it's Russell Westbrook and the Thunder taking on James Harden and the Rockets. Brent Barry will be on the call. Brent, thanks for being with us, and Happy New Year. No problem, Ryan. Happy New Year to you. Looking forward to that tomorrow night. All right. Big regular season game in the NBA tomorrow night, but in the NFL, it's playoff time. Let's welcome in a man who started eight playoff games over his career, including a win in Super Bowl 17, former Redskins quarterback Joe Theismann. And Joe, we're going to dive into the playoffs in just a minute, but let's start with a team you know very well, the Redskins, who missed the playoffs after their Week 17 loss to the Giants. Huge decision needs to be made in Washington, and that involves quarterback Kirk Cousins, who's set to hit the open market. Joe, what should the Redskins do this offseason with their free agent QB? I, I think, Ryan, first of all, Happy New Year to you and everyone listening. I, uh, I think that they, they should sign Kirk Cousins. But when it comes to signing players, both the agent, the player, and the team all have to come to an agreement that is beneficial for everybody. Kirk certainly deserves to be paid because you look at the market. I mean, when you talk about quarterback compensation, you almost have to look at comps when you're looking for a house. You know, what's the house selling for in the area? Joe Flacco, $120 million. Um, Jay Cutler, $120 million. Matthew Stafford, $120 million. You know, this is the number you're talking about. Certainly, if Kirk had had an opportunity to quarterback the Redskins into the playoffs, probably would have made the conversation a little bit easier on his side. But I believe he's proven himself, and he's the quarterback of the future of the Washington Redskins. Sounds like Cousins could be a realtor's dream this offseason. Uh, another name, Joe, yeah. we're hearing uh, coming out of D.C. a lot about is offensive coordinator Sean McVay, who is set to interview for the Rams and 49ers head coaching jobs. Now, McVay turns 31 years old in three weeks, which would make him the youngest head coach in NFL history. What makes McVay ready to be an NFL head coach right now? I think if you look at the production of the offense over the last couple of years with the Washington Redskins, um, you get a sense of how creative he can be on the offensive side of the ball. He's been around John Gruden. He's been around Jay Gruden. Um, his pedigree is very, very strong when it comes to family, who has been in the league for a long time. So he's been around professional football in a lot of different capacities for a long time. I've sat in meetings as he's conducted his meetings during training camp. Uh, I've sat and listened to him go through film with players. He has, a, he has an excellent ability to communicate. And there's, there's two things I think you need to do. First of all, the term head coach today, Ryan, is a misnomer. You're really a head administrator. You know, Jay Gruden found that out in Washington, that you couldn't be the coordinator, you couldn't be the head coach, and you couldn't be the quarterback coach. Too many hats to wear, too many demands on your time. I think Sean understands that. You know, he's grown with Jay. He's worked uh, under John Gruden. He's worked under some terrific coaches. So he understands what it's like to be a head coach and the delegation of, that needs to be done. Um, and he, I don't think he's too young. I think the league has moved towards younger younger coaches. Look at Adam down in uh, Gates down in um, uh, Miami. I mean, that's, that's, it's the trend that's on in the league. You have young players coming out. The young coaches have the ability to communicate with them and teach them. That's the other thing. Uh, and, and Sean is an excellent teacher, too. And we mentioned uh, San Francisco as a possible landing spot for McVay. Recently, you were a little bit critical of the Niners that they gave their prestigious Len Eshman Award for inspirational and courageous play to Colin Kaepernick. Why didn't you agree with the team giving Kaepernick that honor? How do you, how do you give anybody an, an inspiration and courageous award when you're 2-14 and 14 and Cap was 1-11 in his quarterbacking uh, abilities? I mean, it, it, you know, to me... You would hope that you would inspire a victory. You know, and, and remember, and it's important to remember about this award, it's voted on by the players. And I, I did not agree, and I still don't agree, with what Colin Kaepernick did with regard to not standing for the national anthem. I believe it was disrespectful to those who defend the flag and defend this country. You know what I'd like to see happen, Ryan, is I would like to see the National Football League for once stand up as a group not like Clark Hunt has done in Kansas City and said, if you don't stand, you're gone. But as an organization, do what the NBA has done. It is mandated in the rules of the National Football League that you will stand during the playing of the national anthem, our country's national anthem. It's, it should, the NBA does it. Why can't National Football League do it? 
And, what and what type me, of divide do you think that would cause, Joe, if, if the league mandated it, that? It doesn't it, – it wouldn't divide. How many guys have really knelt out of all those players in the National Football League? Let's use the number 1,700. Probably 30 or 40 knelt down, maybe less than that. There wouldn't be a division. It, it's an accepted rule. You, you work for somebody. You work for Sports Illustrated. They have a set of rules that you need to follow. It's that simple. It's the same thing in any – the National Football League, the NBA, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer. They all have rules that need to be followed. If not, we have anarchy in this country. When the five police officers were shot in Dallas, players wanted to honor them with something on their jerseys, and the National Football League would not allow them to do that. What's, what message are you saying, and what standards are you trying to hold people to? Oh, it goes along with the issue with the shoes this year, too, that the players wanted to wear uh, more of to support their respective causes. Uh, Joe, let's move on to playoffs. It is a wild card weekend yeah. coming up in the NFC. The Cowboys, of course, are the top seed, though. The field in the NFC, it's deep. You got the Packers, Giants, Falcons, all playing very good football right now. Who's the team in your eyes to beat in the NFC? I think it's why there's, there's, it's interesting because I've been thinking about this real hard. I think the Green Bay Packers are the team that's on a big roll right now, winning six in a row. And, and you know, they go, as Aaron Rodgers goes, they go. Um, their defense is starting to play better. They got healthy. They, to me, are sort of the wild of the wild cards. But the team that I think is the one that you need to look out for is the Atlanta Falcons, playing much better on the defensive side of the ball. Matt Ryan's had a, an MVP year. Uh, they have a running game to go with it. He's made smart decisions with the football in his hands. They're going to get a, a bye this week. So, you know, they're, they're, they're two games away from having a chance to play in the big one where they haven't been in a long time. But I think Atlanta is the team that, to me, I think can beat the Dallas Cowboys. And on the other side of it, I think the Green Bay Packers are that team that they could be there and nobody should be surprised. Yeah, Packers so hot. Rodgers uh, hasn't thrown a pick over this six-game winning streak. So impressive. How about the AFC? Patriots, obviously the cream of the crop in the AFC. Is there a team out of this six-team field uh, that can knock off New England? If there is one, I think it's the Kansas City Chiefs, which is really an interesting study when you look at the quarterback. I think Tom Brady has thrown 27 touchdown passes, 30 touchdown passes, whatever the number is, and only two interceptions in just the, the, the 12 games he's played. And yet you go to the other side and you take a look at Alex Smith, and he has thrown, I believe, 14 touchdown passes, about half as many as Tom has with four more games. The Kansas City Chiefs are built on keeping the football, not making mistakes, and they'll get Jamar Charles back, which I think will help them as well. So to me, I look at the Kansas City Chiefs as being that, that team in the AFC that are, are sort of like uh, New England and uh, Atlanta. But the team you have to be conscious of in the AFC is the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, their offense is extremely explosive, great running game. But then the question becomes, how well are they going to be able to stop somebody? Is it going to be a scoring fest? It normally never is in the playoffs. And defense does win championships. So the Steelers have got a tough road ahead of them, but they're certainly loaded to be able to go in a certain way. So my wild, wild card in the AFC is Pittsburgh. My wild, wild card in the NFC is Green Bay. We're hoping it's a wild, wild card weekend as well. Always one of the best weekends in football coming up in the NFL. Joe Theismann, thanks for not only being with us, but for your heartfelt thoughts on an issue uh, as clear as uh, near and dear to your heart. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks, Ryan. And that's going to do it for this Wednesday episode of SI Now. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern with more from Maggie and Hall of Fame football coach Bobby Bowden. Until then, stick with SI.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. Have a great afternoon.